prevention of musculoskeletal disorders. My name is Helen Howerhan and I manage the Occupational Health and Hygiene Inspection Unit within the Health and Safety Authority. This webinar is in support of European Week for Safety and Health at Work and EU OSHA's Healthy Workplaces Lighten the Load campaign. This campaign is aims to raise awareness of work-related musculoskeletal disorders and the importance of preventing them. We will place a link to this campaign and links to other uh, useful websites uh, into our chat function. If you go to the links, you'll be taken to EU OSHA's website where you get lots of useful information. There'll also be a link to our ergonomics page on the HSA website and to a risk assessment tool that you will hear about during the webinar. This morning's webinar will be recorded and it will be made available on the HSA website in due course. At the closing of the webinar, you will receive a link to an online survey about the event and we'd ask that you take a minute to fill this up because this will help us in planning future events. And so to this morning's agenda, you will hopefully now see it on your screen. You will hear over the morning from a panel of experts who will give you advice and guidance and tools to help you manage ergonomic risks in your workplaces. There will be time set aside at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. And I'd ask if you have a question that you'd put it into the Q&A function, not into the chat function. Um, if you can't see the Q&A function on your screen, if you go to the three dots on the right hand side of the chat function, then it should appear. So I would now like you to introduce you to our first speaker this morning, Mr. Frank Power. Frank is an ergonomist and an inspector with the Health and Safety Authority. His main area of works includes development of regulations and guidance, regulatory inspections, and representing the authority at EU and national working groups. He has been involved in addressing ergonomic and manual handling issues at a strategic and a workplace level and has acted as an expert witness in the courts. The title of Frank's presentation this morning is Ergonomic Strategy and Interventions at Workplace Level. Thank you, Helen, very much for that introduction. And good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for again joining us for uh, another one of our webinars. Um, I'm going to have a brief overview of what, what strategies uh, the Health and Safety Authority have developed uh, in respect of uh, managing uh, ergonomic risk at workplace level. Um, so the, the agenda for my presentation, you can see there, uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about the ergonomics and the legal context. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll mention as well uh, the important area of uh, musculoskeletal injury and illness data in Ireland and what we have. Uh, but also I'll speak very much on the importance of focusing on not just looking at our illness rates and our injury rates, but also focus more importantly on what our risk exposure levels are in, in a workplace setting, whether that's in a construction site, a factory, a healthcare environment, a transport uh, sector, the retail sector, it doesn't matter. It's the risk exposure that we're interested in managing. And that's something we need to be able to quantify. And that's why I suppose as well that we have a, a lot of emphasis on uh, today around case studies of good practice and risk assessment. Um, I'm going to talk then on the subject of ergonomic risk management and what we really mean by that and what, what we're looking at and what what we as a regulatory body feel is an appropriate standard in terms of managing these risks. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the strategy and how the Health and Safety Authority uh, has developed different interventions so that we can get a, the message out there in terms of what we want to do in terms of addressing risk exposure uh, for manual handling and musculoskeletal issues. So briefly, the legislation is, is the 2005 Safety Health and Welfare Work Act and the Principles of Prevention. And that's important because that talks about, you know, providing safe systems of work. The employer has duties to provide safe systems of work, to manage risks, uh, to uh, look at uh, the risk assessment process uh, with reference to the principles of prevention. So very much a focus on avoiding risk and evaluating unavoidable risks, adapting work to the individual. We then have the manual handling of load regulation of 2007, uh, the space green equipment regulation of 2007, which again, 
uh, you know, we'll be alluding to, you know, in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the work we're doing around remote working and uh, people working from home, uh, as well as in the office. And then uh, we have the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Construction Regulations 2013, which again place duties on designers, project supervisor for design stage, project supervisor construction stage in terms of managing not just safety risks, but also health risks. Um, if you look at all those pieces of legislation, again, it's very much around risk management, avoiding risk, adapting work to the individual, using appropriate means to avoid or reduce risk. So that's 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 where we need to place the focus on. Now, the reality is we have, uh, you know, data that we get, we get accident reports in, in, into the Health and Safety Authority, but in terms of illness data, uh, we, we have different surveys, the CSO Labour Force Survey, found that in each of the five years to 2014 to 2018, the construction was among the top five sectors for accidents leading to four or more days absence from work. And the most common kind of injuries were dislocation, sprain or strain. So most very much uh, around most was little injury. And then the ESRI did work on behalf of the Health and Safety Authority, did the specific work looking at the construction sector and they studied data from 2001 to 2014. And they found that over a period 2002 to 2014, 66% of all illnesses reported by workers in the construction sector were due to musculoskeletal disorders, as opposed to 47% across all the other sectors. Also, the ESRA did a more comprehensive piece of work then looking at all sectors, and what they found was that the risk of MSDs is highest for workers in the construction, agriculture, and health sectors, notwithstanding that there are high levels for other sectors, but these were the three that stood out. They also found that higher workplace inspection rates were linked to lower levels of MSDs. Therefore, in increased inspection could be an important element of MST prevention, not the only one, of course. And I suppose to complement that as well, we're, we are, as Helen said, we're, we are in European Health and Safety Week this week, and the Health and Safety Authority is involved in a, an inspection campaign in the construction sector, uh, which is looking at work at height, but also looking at the man management of man handling risk in construction. So that's an important element of the interventions. But as I said earlier, we can't just we cannot just focus on injury and illness rates. We need to focus as well on measuring risk exposure and quantifying risk exposure, uh, because the reality is that these these situations these kind of things exist. Uh, you know, and for example, you know, we have a, this example here from the National Ambulance Service. It's a case study that we produced with them. Um, but it was as a result of an intervention by a colleague inspector where there were issues. And this example here, this photo just shows a paramedic trying to lift a defibrillator from, a, uh, you know, the wall of the, the internal of the ambulance uh, and kneeling on the, on the stretcher. And typically a stretcher, there would be a patient in a stretcher. So this was not an ideal system of work. And there was a high level of risk exposure. So, in fairness, the National Ambulance Service, uh, tr you know, through intervention by ourselves, looked at this and came up with a solution over a period of time, which addressed concerns around clinical risk, but more importantly, from our perspective as well, addressed the physical risk exposures uh, for the paramedics in that they were now able to access the uh, defibrillator from the back of the ambulance uh, without interfering with the patient and also being able to do that with a bit much better posture. Then we have examples from construction where, you know, we came across situations where uh, workers were installing cladding, which weighed up to 90 to 100 kilos in weight. So we know straight straight away that there's risk exposure there in terms of high excessive force levels, very awkward postures, sustained awkward postures. So they, there's no doubt that there's risk exposures there and, and they need to be managed. But then again, we need to look at how we can actually assess those risks. And in this example, the as a result of an intervention by ourselves again the company embraced this uh, and come up with a solution uh, to avoid that kind of risk exposure so when we talk about risk management what do we require well we require that managers are committed to recognize and managing these risks particularly if it's uh, applicable in, in in their workplace and this is something that needs to be looked at in, in a very open way uh, if there are potential risks uh, related to manual handling or musculoskeletal injury the uh, organization needs to look at developing competencies to manage ergonomic risk uh, so that those who are doing the risk assessment of these risks can, can be, apply and use appropriate risk assessment tools. For example, the Health and Safety Executive MAC tool and other relevant tools like the RAP tool. And I know Ethan's going to talk about different tools later on for risk assessment, but these are two that we very much uh, endorse and, and feel are appropriate. And uh, some of you might have been on our webinars. Uh, 
uh, already uh, we have another webinar next on the 3rd of November as well, where there'll be more detail given, the practical detail on the application of these tools. We need, we need to develop innovative engineering organizational interventions to manage ergonomic risk. Very important that we just don't depend on training. We need to look at the risk exposures and manage those. Communicate and consult with employees at all stages of the process. The workers, uh, you know, have a big part to play uh, and it's important that they are listened to and you get their views in terms of potential risk. Providing relevant training in the use of new equipment and new method statements or new risk assessment method statements. Completing good quality manual handling risk assessments which clearly identify whether or not there are high or very high risk ergonomic risk factors and then what are the appropriate controls. So this example here again, it's another case study that we developed with uh, a company called John Crane and Shannon. This was a risk exposure. There was a number of issues here. The individual here, the first thing in terms of the task description, the individual had to lift this part into the lathe machine for machining. These parts, again, were very, very heavy. They weighed up to 65 to 70 kgs. Uh, there were a number of risk exposures. And, you know, you may not know what this chart is, but this is from the MAC tool. It's a score sheet for the MAC tool. Uh, which again, Ita will reference in the next presentation. Uh, but we see there, there's a lot of purple, there's a purple and there's a red color, there's three red colors. So there's definite risk exposure there in terms of load weight, hand distance from the lower back, trunk twisting, and the grip on the load. So, you know, the legislation says that if, if uh, an activity involves risk, well then you as an employer have to address that risk. So in this example here, the company came up with a very clever solution and the, the idea for this solution was very much uh, an idea that the worker here in the photo had. Uh, so it's just a question really of working with him and management providing the necessary resources so they could come up with that solution and eliminate the risk exposures. So that's the kind of standard I suppose we're looking at and that's what we're looking for employers to have, uh, you know, to focus on. And, you know, if an inspector calls that these are the kind of good quality risk assessments that would be available. So you probably won't see this, in, in, but it is in our guidance documents. And I know you are various, but up the links. Uh, the managing ergonomic risk to improve musculoskeletal health or risk assessment for managing ergonomic risk. There's a five step template in there on page 14 to 16 of the publication, I think it is. There's a uh, five steps, task description, collecting technical information, identifying the risk factors using the relevant risk assessment tool, identifying what improvements are going to be put in place and re reviewing the effectiveness of the improvements. So that five step template is a very useful reference for carrying out risk assessments to manage ergonomic risks in our workplaces. The tools, as I said, there's three tools that the HSE have developed. The back tool, which is, looks at lifting, carrying and team, team handling activities. The wrap tool, which looks at pushing and pulling of heavy loads. And there's lots of that that happens in Irish workplaces. And then the R tool is more specific in looking at uh, assessment of repetitive tasks of the upper limbs. Uh, so it's a little, a little bit different in terms of how it's how it's used. But again, the more the most important aspect, uh, the most important point to make about these tools is two things. First of all, they're evidence based, so they're they they are very well validated. And secondly, they're they're pretty easy to use once you get familiar with them. So just briefly in terms of to finish off, the Health and Safety Authority has a strategy around managing ergonomic risks and with a focus on increasing knowledge and understanding of occupational health risks, raising awareness of the importance of managing these risks, and then ensuring legal compliance through proportionate enforcement. Uh, and that, a lot of that would be true inspection. So what we've done in terms of that, there's a number of things we've done. We've, we've developed inspector competency in addressing these ergonomic risks. So all of our, all of our inspectors are trained in the use of the HSE risk assessment tool. We're continuing to develop our risk assessment workshops and webinars, uh, and we've had two, as I said, already this year. We have another one next week. Uh, we're developing risk assessment guidance which complements the use of these risk assessment tools. And we're also developing case studies of good practice so that we can share and disseminate examples of what Irish companies are doing, both small and medium and large, in terms of managing these risks. And then we have specific inspection campaigns in different sectors, including the construction sector and health sector. So this is, these are just a couple of examples of case studies that have been produced by ourselves. And again, all this information is available on our website. And finally, these are the links uh, that you'll see in, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, chat function that Barry put up. Uh, please 
you know, have a look at those links. There's very useful information in there. And that's really all I have. So thank you very much for coming along here today. Thanks, Helen, very much. Thank you, Frank. Our next speaker this morning is Ita Layden, Managing Director of Layden Consulting Engineers Limited. Now, Ita is a consultant ergonomist and a forensic engineer and has over 25 years experience in a variety of roles spanning ergonomics, engineering, training and safety. And in her current role, she provides expertise to a variety of industries, including the retail, transport, manufacturing and construction sectors. Ita will now provide you with an introduction to risk assessment tools for managing musculoskeletal disorders. Thank you very much, Helen, for the introduction. So, as Helen mentioned, I'm going to talk you through the variety of assessment tools that are out there, and I will focus specifically then on the tools that are endorsed by the Health and Safety Authority. So, just in relation to the variety of tools that are out there, I'm going to talk to you uh, through some that are uh, non-proprietary in nature. And um, regardless of the tool that you use, um, some are proprietary in that you have to, they're copyrighted and you have to subscribe to a particular organization to be able to use the tools that they have copyrighted and developed. However, I'm quite practical when it comes to these things. There are many, many tools out there that are non-proprietary in nature where you, and there are many, lots of information available on how to use these alternative tools um, on the intra, uh, internet. And then I'm going to talk you through some of those recommended tools, as I said. So in terms of the non-proprietary tools that are out there, we have the now becoming more commonly used HSE's suite of tools, and they consist of ART, MAC, and RAP. The ART tool stands for Assessment of Repetitive Tasks, and this tool is used for, or can be used for the assessment of um, repetitive tasks that uh, the repetition is continued for um, a repeated a number of times every second or every couple of minutes and is um, continued for more than an hour in a, any particular shift. And it's involved, it's assessed, it's involves the assessment of purely the upper limbs. Then you have the MAC tool and the MAC stands for manual assessment charts. And the MAC tool provides us with an assessment tool and guide to assess tasks involving lifting and lowering, involving carrying, or involving a team handling operation. Then you have the RAP tool, and RAP stands for Risk Assessment of Pushing and Pulling. And this tool can be used for assessment of tasks involving pushing and pulling on wheeled or non-wheeled equipment. Now, what, before I talk about the rest of the, the, the tools or a selection of tools that I've chosen today, um, 80 to 90 percent of tasks or activities will be able to be assessed using one or more of these tools. However, um, in the event of an activity or a task not um, fitting into the um, selection process for use of one of those tools, you are best advised to engage a competent ergonomist to carry out a general ergonomic assessment. The other, the next two tools I'm going to talk about again are uh, quite well known and would have been used extensively globally as well. And they are RULA and RIBA. RULA stands for the risk assessment of, um, sorry, rapid upper limb assessment. And RIBA stands for rapid entire body assessment. So as the name suggests, one is focused on assessing the risks associated with the upper limbs, and the other is associated with assessing an overall um, task that involves uh, the overall or entire body. These two tools were developed by um, McAtomy and Corlett in the University of Nottingham, I think, um, and they've been in use from the uh, early 90s and uh, uh, noughties. Um, the, again, one advantage of these tools is that they are rapid once you are familiar with the um, the documentation and the scoring guide, uh, they can be carried out quite quickly. However, one of the slight drawbacks um, that we have with the RULA and RIBA tool 
are that a, a certain level of competence is required to identify where you need to focus your improvement strategy having completed a RULA or a REBA assessment. Um, the RULA and REBA assessments give you an overall assessment score. And based on that assessment score, that will tell you whether or not the level of risk is acceptable or more needs to be done. However, um, because the various risk factors are weighted, um, it's not possible to see the um, exact area of focus. So if I could give you an example with RULA, with the RULA tool, you will assess the risk factors associated with the wrist, then you'll assess the risk factor associated with the upper limb, and then the, the, or the upper arm, and then the lower arm, um, et cetera. Um, and at the end, you'll get an overall score, but you won't be able to ascertain um, without a, a degree of competence whether or not that overall score is heavily weighted because of the upper limb posture or the upper arm posture or the lower arm posture or the wrist. And um, again, as I'm going to mention with the Mac and Art and Wrap tool, one of the advantages of those tools is that you will be able to identify where you need to focus your improvements. Then we have um, the NIOSH lifting equation again. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this, which is primarily from the, it's from the US. And uh, it's based on an assessment of the biomechanics of a lifting task. Um, it's quite detailed. It gets into, there's a requirement here to um, detail measurements, um, that distances are held away from the body, et cetera. Um, and if that level of detail is, is available, um, the NIOSH lifting equation can give you a very detailed assessment. However, as I'm going to say and show you in a few moments, in comparison um, studies between using the NIOSH lifting equation and, for example, the HSE MAC tool, both correlated quite well. And um, when ergonomists use both systems, uh, at the end of the assessment, they came to the same conclusions in relation to risk. However, with the HSE MAC tool, as you'll see in a few moments, there was no requirement to carry out physical measurements of distances, et cetera, which makes it a much easier uh, um, tool to use or a much more user friendly tool. Um, then uh, you have tools such as the OCRA or, or the Occupational Repetitive Actions uh, Assessment. And this is from EN 1005, which is to do with the safety of machinery. And this tool would be used when carrying out an assessment of the repeti repetitive tasks involved with running or operating machinery. You have the uh, OVACO Working Posture Analysis System. This was again a US developed um, system which looks at the overall body. You have your quick exposure check, and this was developed by the Health and Safety Executive in the UK. It's probably the precursor to the um, the existing suite of tools. Um, um, and this again was just it's, it's a, a quick and um, effective way of assessing the overall risk of exposure to musculoskeletal ill health. And then you have um, another example called the strain index. And the strain index is a tool that focuses specifically on the upper limbs. In fact, focus is on the wrists and the hands. So there are, as I say, there's only a selection of the tools that are available. Um, each of the tools, however, do allow you to focus or assess the key risk factors for um, musculoskeletal ill health. They, of course, are your posture, your force, your frequency, your duration, and your exposure to vibration. Um, and importantly, regardless, as I say, of which uh, assessment tool you decide to use, some, do, some require a greater degree of competency and should only be used by those with a, a, a distinguished competency in ergonomics, whereas some tools can be carried, can be used and trialed with um, a, a limited knowledge of uh, and a bit of practice in relation to um, musculoskeletal ill health. And on that note, um, I'm going to talk you through a little bit more of the MAC art and wrap tools. And the MAC tool, um, independently benchmarked by the Health and Safety Laboratory in the UK against the REBA, the quick exposure check and the NIOSH lifting equation. And the results of that uh, independent review or benchmarking exercise 
was that the Mac was ranked as one of the easiest of the five tools to use. So you're already on a, a positive if you're starting to use the Mac tool. It's easier to use than the others. And it was deemed as one of the most appropriate methods for assessing manual handling operations. And the exercise also showed, as I mentioned, that there were no systemic differences in how the different methods ranked the levels of risk. So you're pretty much going to come to the same conclusion, whether you use the NIOSH lifting equation, um, the REBA, the quick exposure check, or MAC. And of course, as Frank mentioned, MAC is endorsed by the Health and Safety Authority, and it's the one that the authority would recommend that you, um, you go out and trial and apply in your workplace. Then we have the ART tool, and again, this was um, independently assessed and benchmarked against the OCRA index, which I mentioned is from the um, um, uh, EN1005 about the safety of machinery and the strain index. And again, the benchmarking exercise indicated that the levels of risk were in broad agreement with each other in relation to each method. Um, however, as I've previously um, mentioned, the ART tool is much more user friendly um, than the OCRA index or strain index, and it doesn't require the, the, the in-depth knowledge of ergonomics to apply. And of course, the final one I'm mentioning here is the risk assessment of pushing and pulling, again, developed by the Health and Safety Executive in the UK, and it is, again, independently assessed to be, uh, uh, the tool is sufficiently usable and reliable as a an indicator of the risk factor. I think importantly, when you look at each of the tools and you start to use the HSEs, Mac, RAP and ART tools, they all have the same touch and feel. And I think that's very important, when, especially when you are trying to get buy-in to make improvements of, uh, for ergonomics in a particular workplace that, uh, the uh, stakeholders can get to understand the color coding and can understand the method going across each of the tools. Um, and as Frank mentioned, each of the, the tools have a guidance document and the Health and Safety Authority have also produced the Risk Assessment for Managing Ergonomic Risks publication. Um, and this is available uh, through the links that are on your in the chat box at the moment. And they, this will show you some worked examples of using these tools. That said, um, you'll also get a link to the Health and Safety Executives website um, where uh, each of those to these tools is provided with um, a range of exercises and videos that allows um, anyone to trial the tools and compare the uh, results that you get with the results by the ex experts in the HSE in the UK. So again, as with uh, as you won't get with proprietary um, assessment tools, you will get this information available uh, with free access when you use non-proprietary tools such as these. So just to give you an overview of the touch and feel of the um, assessment tools. So all of the tools, the Art, Mac, Art and RAP, um, it, for completion of them, you follow a process flow. And um, the process flow is presented in a color coded format, and you literally work through each of the steps. So, as you'll see on the left hand side of your screen, there you have a start, and the, um, you start and you first assess arm movements. And then there's guidance in the um, associated publication to uh, help you score the um, arm movements uh, based on whether your observation is that there is limited movement or there is a pretty much constant movement of the arms. Now, what you're also able to do with art is that at the same at the same time in parallel, you assess both the left and the right hand side of the body and um, using ruler or rapid upper limb assessments. Um, you would need to do two different assessments. So you do one ruler for the left and then you'd repeat that for the right hand side. So again, another cost uh, time saving, I should say, element of the art tool is you assess both the left and right at the same time. And the graphics that you'll see there on this screen are some of the graphics from the supporting documentation for art. 
and they're quite descriptive. But as you'll see there for the wrist, for example, you'll see if the wrist is, what you're observing is if the wrist is flexed or extended, or it's deviated to the right or left-hand side. You don't have to go to the extent of um, measuring the actual angles of the wrist as um, you do for so many of the other assessment tools. So it's based on that observation, you each risk factor has a score associated with it and a color code. And these are filled in on the score sheet, which you'll see there on the top right hand corner of this screen. And um, each has, a, as I say, a color code, which gives you the level of risk and the uh, uh, scores associated with that. And at the end of an art tool, you get an overall exposure score. So the one that's showing here is 27, which um, gives us an indication that this is a score of 22 or more. It's a high risk and further investigation is required urgently. Um, and that's generally how with the art tool that will then allow us to identify where do we need to focus our improvements. So with the art tool, we'd focus our improvements on the red risks and then we'd focus on the highest number in each of those red risks. So here we're going to, you'd be focusing on arm, um, arm movements and repetition um, uh, would be the first two factors that you'd focus on if you're trying to improve that activity or task. The MAC process, then again, you'll see the same type of color coding and your same type of process flow that you start and you assess the load weight frequency, then you assess the hand distance from the lower back, etc. Now, one of the things with the MAC tool is that each individual risk factor is assessed on its own merit. You, you don't use your traditional uh, end score as your um, indicator of risk. So if you get a red score and a red color in terms of the load weight frequency, that in itself is sufficient to say that that's a high risk activity and you need to address the load weight that someone is carrying or the frequency of them carrying that um, particular um, load. Um, and those results are then also recorded on your score sheet. And your score sheet has each individual risk factor in the, um, the first column and then a color. So here on the score sheet you're seeing on your screens at the moment, instead of um, using fancy markers and putting in your red and your amber and your green, uh, I've used the letters R, A, G um, to indicate the color for that particular risk factor. And the graphics again that you're looking at, you'll see there in the middle and you'll see that when you're looking at the hand distance from the lower back, you have uh, quite good graphics that again, you're not measuring angles, you're just looking at what are you observing, what's the worst case scenario of the particular handing activity um, that's been carried out and where are the hands relative to the lower back or indeed the other risk factor that we're looking at there is what is the grip that someone has on the load. Now, one additional thing that we have with the MAC and the RAP tool is we have a purple risk. So again, traditionally we're used to our green, amber and red, but uh, purple risk is introduced here in the MAC tool and indeed in the RAP tool, which means that this presents a very high level of risk. And to give you an indication here, um, for the load weight frequency in MAC, if an individual has to lift more than 50 kilograms once per day, that puts that, that particular lift, regardless of whether they're holding it close to their upper torso or lifting it from the ground, lifting 50 kilogram, more than 50 kilograms is a very high level of risk for one individual um, based on the MAC tool. And our wrap, again, just to show you that when using the wrap tool, you have your process flow, you have your score sheet, and you have your graphics. And again, you have your explanation of your levels of risk. And each individual risk factor is again taken on its own merit. And one final thing, of course, that I need to mention when we talk about ergonomic risk assessment is that we should also ensure, particularly now with our hybrid working becoming more, more prominent, that it's also necessary to carry out a VDU or DSE, Display Screen Equipment Assessment. And the tool that is best suited to this is the tool um, presented by the Health and Safety Authority in their recent publication um, on the COVID um, return to work protocol. 
And this tool allows you to adequately assess either it can be applied in an office or a site scenario or a home working environment. And importantly here, in just a quick reminder that it is a requirement that anybody who is working from home or working in an office or indeed sharing between both, they're entitled to have the workstation assessed. So um, it may be necessary to carry out two assessments for an individual, which would be their home workplace and or their home office and their site office. So that was my whistle stop through the um, various assessment tools that are um, available or some of them and the recommendation in relation to using map, art and wrap. And just in relation to those, um, the what I would recommend in relation to using map, art and wrap is to use a platform called Easy Ergo which allows um, effective completion of Mac art and wrap in a fraction of the time in terms of a paper based system. So I'll hand back and say thank you very much. Thank you, Eta. The first of two case studies will now be presented by David Donahue from the National Rehabilitation Hospital in Dublin. David served his time as an electrician and went on to become a foreman in electrical controls and switchgear manufacturing. He came to the National Rehabilitation Hospital in 2004 and became foreman in 2011. He worked alongside the head planning team in the planning of a new 120 bed facility at the hospital as electrical advisor, and he worked closely with the electrical engineers and design team in this role. I'll now hand you over to David. Thanks, Helen. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Frank said in his presentation earlier on, uh, I'm here to go through one of the case studies which shows how the National Rehabilitation Hospital managed ergonomic risks through the introduction of a range of engineering and organisational improvements in the way work was carried out to avoid, reduce or risk of musculoskeletal injury. Um, so, first of all, before, um, before I go on to that, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to the background of the National Rehabilitation Hospital. So uh, the NRH provides a comprehensive range of specialised rehabilitation services to adult and paediatric patients who, as a result of an accident, illness or injury, have acquired a physical or cognitive disability and require specialist rehabilitation. The NRH is the only service of its type in the country and provides treatment for patients from throughout Ireland. At the NRH, treatment is, and care to patients is delivered by consultant-led interdisciplinary teams in the following areas of speciality. Brain injury, spinal cord, system of care, prostatic, orthotic and limb absence rehabilitation, otherwise known as polar, uh, and paediatric family centred rehabilitation. Um, next slide, sorry. Um, at the NRH treatment and care, uh, sorry, um, I have to excuse me, I'm new to this. <laughs> Uh, for many years, the NIH operated in the old building, uh, which was a former sanatorium designed for patients suffering from tuberculosis, and the wards were multi-patient nightingale-type wards, which were not best suited for rehabilitation therapy. So the National Rehabilitation Hospital, in partnership with the Health Service Executive, required the construction of a 120-bed rehabilitation hospital. This project commenced in 2016, with completion and handover of the building taking place in 2020, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. As part of the, um, as part of the study, as part of the, I'm trying to get on to the next slide, sorry. Hi David, this is Hugh here. Do you want me to take over the slides for you? No, it's okay. I think I have it here now, yeah. Okay. As part of our good place practice study, uh, we first of all had to identify the problems. Uh, and as part of this new building project, our case study shows, shows how we first had to understand and consider the requirements of our end users, the patients. Designing spaces for people with complex disabilities is a challenge, particularly in the design of patient ensuite and showers. The hygiene care needs of individuals comp with complex rehabilitation requirements can range from needing the assistance of two staff to becoming fully independent and meeting their own needs. The two main principles which had the two main principles which had to be met in the design of patient en suites were number one that there was su sufficient space for transfers uh, 
for the shower chair and number two for the use of shower trolleys and space for carers. During the delivery of intimate care, such as bathing, toileting, there is the likelihood uh, that significant manual handling risk factors, such as awkward bending and twisting or postures, if spatial planning is not considered in the ensuite design process, effective spatial planning gives carers comfortable space to assist patients in meeting their hygiene requirements. Poor design and layout of spaces can, un can unintentionally create barriers for patients in maximising their fullest potential for independence and self-care. So the next stage of our, uh, our plan was problem solving process. After the NRH was given the approval to progress construction, the NRH took the opportunity to test and improve spaces provided for patients and staff, allowing us to ensure that both area allocation and layout would enhance patients' independence levels and provide a comfortable workspace for staff as carers when giving the assistance. In the initial stages, the project our health planning team who are the clients representatives of the new hospital project got input from staff and patients around their preference for ensuite space and the layout best suit their needs the technical services team then built a mock-up 20 square meters bedroom with nine square meter and six square meter ensuite room in a disused building on the campus to provide the real life testing facility the team brought in samples of sanitary wear and put them into the mobile plinths so they could easily be relocated around the en-suites. Redundant equipment was repurposed and reused uh, in the bedroom and en-suites, such as beds, chairs, shower trolleys, stuff like that. So finally, the health planning team set up weekly visits over a six month period in the mock-up rooms, allowing healthcare professionals from all across the disciplines to give input. So the, what, what we done was when we set up these rooms, we, we put little, People who come in, they stuck up little sticky notes to say what would suit best and height wires, where things were located. And, uh, it worked out pretty well. So, look at the next slide, sorry. Okay, so from the uh, contribution of the weekly visits from was only it wasn't only healthcare professionals. We also had former patients and patients that were there at the time who would visit the mock-up room. Uh, we got the following uh, good feedback: the layout of rooms, the issues experienced in terms of space for transfers, the carrying out of personal care, other manual handling risks, and the type of sanitary wear and other equipment being proposed. So overall, we got a very good picture uh, as to what was going to go into these new bedrooms. Stage three then was the outcome of this. So we got feedback and this was collated uh, by the NRH planning team and formed a brief for the appointed design team and how the layouts and setting out of the fitting of these rooms should be addressed to maximize the user's needs. En suites of nine square meters and six square meters were included in the brief for the development. Other recommendations in the feedback were as following. We had centrally located toilets and nine square en suites. Uh, we'd agreed layout of sanitary wear, heights of toilets for flexibility when using equipment, example, spinal toilets, toilets, the length of shower houses uh, for ease of showering a patient on a shower trolley. So we had longer shower houses uh, to help the height of the shower chair over toilets, uh, which helped in, in helping out with patients, toilet, toilet procedures uh, and bariatric toilet requirements. So stage four then is the results of, of the study. So uh, poor design and layout of spaces can unintentionally create barriers for patients in maximizing their fullest potential for independent and self-care. The results of the research and planning has meant that a new rehabilitation hospital features rooms which demonstrate an awareness of an individual needs for patients. Complex patient solutions dependent on the patient's individual needs are now in place. There's also future flexibility to particular needs and individualized configurations. So the big benefits, uh, including risk, risk factors like forced repetition posture have been eliminated or reduced. We have an, uh, evidence of innovation and creative thinking, of good teamwork, consultation and communication, management commitment and investment and the return on that investment. 
And finally, we have the evidence of increased knowledge and awareness of ergonomics. So that's basically our case study from the NRH, uh, and thanks for listening today. Thank you, David. We'll now have a short break and we'll start back in five minutes. Um, I'll, after the break, after the short break, uh, this, the next speakers will be introduced by Chiara Leva of the Irish Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. So if we just take a five minute break, have a few stretches and I'll see you back here in five minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. I'll now hand you over to Chiara Leva of the Irish Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, and she will introduce our next speakers. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so it's a pleasure that on behalf of uh, the Irish Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, uh, in which I'm covered the role of secretary for this year, we organize a series of webinars, as most of you might know, um, on the last Thursday of each month. And during one of those webinars, we have the pleasure of uh, having uh, uh, Terry and uh, David uh, speaking about uh, um, the case study that uh, we invited to present uh, for today as well as a very good practice from um, any processing facility. So Terry uh, worked for Scary Food uh, and uh, is in production management role uh, and uh, in business support role and is doing a master in organizational behavior in uh, DCU. Uh, David has a background in chemistry, math uh, and environmental health and safety management and human factors is currently doing um, a PhD also in TU Dublin and uh, he's been uh, working as a technical health and environmental uh, and safety and quality manager within uh, chemical food manufacturing and waste recovery sector is currently a compliance manager for Enva Ireland. So without further ado, I leave the floor to you, Terry and David, uh, if you can activate your camera. Thank you. Hey, first things first, Chiara, much appreciated for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, the next thing is, uh, this is a, a brief case study relating to some work which began to unfold in 24 in in Q4 of 2019. I'm still happy to report, I'm happy to report that it's still unf unfolding. Um, it relates to a human factors intervention within the meat processing sector, which had a significant benefit um, to muscular MSD rates and staff attrition in particular. So if we want to bounce to the next slide, please. Uh, so starting from the top very quickly, just running through the definitions. We know that physical ergonomics looks at physical activity and the biomechanical characteristics. Cognitive ergonomics looks at uh, perception, reasoning, and motor response. Organizational ergonomics looks at processes and policies. And human factors is a systems discipline, which when applied should optimize safety, resilience, and efficiency. And we know that MSDs can be multifactorial in nature and affect most of us. Uh, next slide. The risk factors, simple and straightforward. We know them all. Uh, we can expect higher levels of risk when there's repetitive static, awkward, prolonged uh, postures, forced duration, vibration, significant biopsychosocial factors present. So, okay, so this is the important slide. So we were working for a large food manufacturing uh, company within which there was one particular department which employed 80 workers. This cohort were charged with the task of breaking down a ham leg, which involved a lot of knife work. This is, um, this, this uh, contained, this process contained a number of very significant risk factors. Now, approximately 10 years ago, this particular department had actually been redesigned and the department moved from piece boning to line boning, which line boning essentially involves a conveyor. And with that change, most of the significant physical ergonomic risks uh, were actually designed out. But over a period of time, we saw musculoskeletal disorders creep back into the equation and in addition to that, back in 2019, the staff, uh, sorry, the team losing almost 37% uh, uh, their staff through attrition on an annual basis. So this, uh, as let's say we had designed out the physical ergonomic factors, this pointed us in the direction of the psychosocial factors, which um, were obviously having an impact within this department. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, so looking at those psychosocial factors, we all know them. Uh, staff may have had little control over the work. They have been sustained periods of high attention, little, connection, little control over the allocation of effort, underused skills, minimal involvement in decisions, 12 decisions, work was repetitive, the pace was machine driven, 
demands perceived to be quite high. And communication and social interaction could have been better. Self-esteem and status is uh, a little bit questionable as well. So next slide. So with those factors identified, uh, noting the MSD rate and the rate of staff attrition, this brought us to look at the stress illness mechanism, stress mechanism and biopsychosocial model of disease a little bit closer. Now, uh, on review of the flight or fight response, uh, we know that there's three phases, alarm, resistance and exhaustion. And cortisol is expected to be released into the body during the second phase, uh, resistance to pain. Cortisol in that scenario would have a beneficial impact, helping to, say, minimize the risk of inflammation. But prolonged exposure to cortisol uh, can cause muscle wastage and other cell changes. Now, this um, now, now, now on review of let's say related research, it also became very very apparent that um, people who endure small recurring daily hassles, such as losing one's keys. Uh, money problems, broken washing machines, so on and so forth, may endure smaller doses of cortisol um, with uh, throughout the course of the day or period of time with little recovery between those doses. And let's say people who endured prolonged periods of stress done to demonstrate higher levels of illness and chronic disease. So next slide. So knowing this, we as a project team had to come up with a plan of action. Now, a participatory approach was obvious. Uh, it was an obvious course of, uh, it was an obvious course of action. Uh, we knew that um, if we changed workers' perceived level of control, if we brought them straight into the mix, we would, it would have uh, a beneficial impact on the MSD rates. Uh, so, so the participatory approach had to happen. It was obvious and straightforward. It was. Uh, so, next slide, please. We also used the Copenhagen questionnaire, otherwise referred to as COPSEC 3. Uh, SEC 3 would be the most cited method for measuring psychosocial aspects, psychosocial factors and it will be cited by the WHO as being best practice. So COPSEC 3, we use the medium form, approximately 55, 65 odd questions. A worker would make it through the COPSEC questionnaire in approximately two to five minutes max. And as you can see there, it's split up into domains and dimensions. The domains being demands at work, job content, interpersonal relationships, individual interface, social capital, and health and well-being. So COPSEC 3 easily helped us to identify what psychosocial factors were actually present within the present cohort. And with these results, we were then able to lever discussion and improvement. Next slide. Uh, another tool we used was the NASA TLX tool. Now, this was developed by NASA uh, when they were training astronauts way back when. And, uh, the NASA TLX tool looks at task demands and human capability. It won't tell us it won't tell us where things are right or wrong. It's used to indicate whether changes have had a positive or a negative impact uh, by looking at mental, physical, temporal, performance, effort, and frustration. Okay, next slide. Terry, do you want to take this? Yeah, yeah, I'll take this one. So as David would have said there, we use the participatory approach. The the the, the, the model that we used to bring the team on board was the Hackman and Oldman uh, job design. So what we asked the management team in the area is, hey, look at the jobs, look at it from a human perspective, and how would you rate those jobs? So when they looked at through skill variety, autonomy, the jobs as were broken down, they scored very, very low. So uh, 
that kind of influenced the guys to take this on board themselves. And the question really was, what can you do at a local level that you don't need a huge level of company intervention for? What can you do as people managers and as line leaders? And then we use that, we, then we use the COPSOC and the NASA TLX to validate the results that we're getting from the, from the two models. So what that led us into then was really into a, a job design uh, or a, a job crafting model where the, the line leaders took the, the guys off the line, they process mapped it, and they asked the guys, how would you do it yourselves, guys? Um, the, 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 the results of that were really, really impressive. Uh, I sat in a couple of the sessions myself where the people on the lines actually said, I wouldn't do it that way, I'd do it this way. And I'd take the job from him and I'd give it to me. And they, share, they, they, they shared the jobs a lot more evenly. Um, they came up with a, a process whereby instead of having the lines full of people, they put less people on the lines, but had more lines um, available, uh, processing more product. So the result of that was the process was slowed down. It was allowed for more, for more accuracy in the work. And really the guys being involved in it themselves and designing their own work uh, was really, really beneficial. So we'll see some of the benefits now in the next slides. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the results were when we did the COPSOC, we did it uh, pre-intervention. So we had uh, one of our, uh, an independent officer uh, from the company uh, administered the questionnaire um, with, with, with each one of the individuals uh, to, to, to get their the feedback. We did this uh, in January, pre-intervention, and we did it again in, in April, uh, post-intervention. And as you'll see from the results there, all of the, uh, the, 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 the psychosocial adjustments, they, they, they all improved. People felt that the demand of their work, uh, they, they felt that their work was less demanding. They felt that, there was, that they had more social capital in it and they felt that their health and well-being uh, was better. Uh, we'll see more on the next slide. Um, th th there's a lot of information on this slide, but I'm just going to draw your attention to a couple of specifics. Um, they, they, they called out, we, we we did the COPSOC, but we also had conversations with people through the, 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 the brown paper exercises and specifically calling out were emotional demands and work-life conflict. People told us that they were going home exhausted. They were anxious, as David would refer to it, this constant stress and pressure was niggling away at them during the day and they were bringing that home with them. They weren't sleeping well and uh, they, they felt that, that, that their work was impacting their life outside the workplace. Um, another one that we thought was quite interesting was people felt that uh, their influence in the work, that increased quite significantly. So again, playing into the self-determination piece of motivation, that people felt that they had a level of autonomy within their workplace. Um, their possibility for development, that, that shot up. So people, they felt that they, they could contribute, that uh, and there was more for them, you could say, in life or in the workplace. That has had a, a knock-on effect where say so right right here right now we've had um just this year alone we've had seven people promoted out of that specific area which is more than the entire site put together where people feel like you know i can contribute and i can and, and i can and i can i can i can give more and also the one i think that's most specific as well is around recognition that people felt recognized for their jobs so again it's just that that sense of contributing um and a sense of purpose about what they're doing really really came through in terms of the the, the copsoc results you want to go on to the next slide? Uh, the NASA total load index, again, all of the measures uh, improved on that. Um, referencing back to the stress uh, that, that pe people felt under, the mental load dropped really considerably there. You'll see it from kind of up around 80 uh, to closer to 50. The physical load um, and, and the pace, because we redistributed the work and because the, the guys took on different tasks at different points of the line, uh, the pace dropped considerably. The guys just had, they had more time. They had time to do the job better, uh, which had a knock-on effect, which is in the job crafting piece, was that there was a considerable reduction in, in rework or what would be referred to as nuisance work. Uh, the frustration of doing a job and then having to do it again, it, it, it was just, just pressure that the guys didn't need on top of a high work pace uh, in the first place. So uh, a considerable reduction. In the, in the mental load and, and the pace that the guys were experiencing. If we can have the next slide. Um, and how did that result then in, in, in the actual attrition of the staff themselves? You'll see down at the bottom of the, 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 the slide there, some of the, the, the motivation behind this intervention intervention was, as David referred to was, we were having, uh, we were losing 30 people per year, there or thereabouts, which in around 
between 35 and 40 percent attrition in the room. The knock on from that was, uh, let alone uh, the, the, the cost of reduction of skills, the morale in the area, um, and as an organization, our employer brand within the area was struggling. All those things were suffering. Um, any opportunity to make significant improvement in the area was continuously getting knocked back because people were leaving uh, and we, we just we just couldn't really uh, move forward. So year on year, we were losing in around 30 people um, for a variety of reasons, but mainly between uh, poor attendance, which was a manifestation of frustration uh, and different types of things, or people just leaving the company. Um, what we saw in 2020 uh, poster intervention was that we went from uh, losing in the region of 30 people a year that we lost one. Um, now, in early 2020, that was possibly influenced by uh, by COVID, and we can't really measure that, but we have seen that follow into 2020 one where we've had I think it's five people leave so our goal at the initial uh, start of the project was that we if we could reduce it down to 10 we'd be doing really really well so went to one which is probably a little bit extreme but we're finding a bit of balance there now which is around um, five is, is, is kind of a more moderate figure um, and we're also seeing a considerable number of people leaving the department to go into new roles within the company which is a very very positive thing within the area if we can go into the next slide uh, that's just another uh, representation of the attrition numbers over the course of the year. So, you know, they're, they're relatively spread out at different times across the year. And if we go into the next slide. Um, and this is the one around the MSDs. So we were, again, we were recording 22 in, in 2017, uh, 2018, and that was probably quite representative of, of the previous years. I'm sure if we went into 15, 16, they were probably in around the same type of numbers. Uh, we did have a change in, in staffing and we believe that 2019 was underreported. So uh, we'd say that 2019 was probably similar to the other years where we were getting in around the 20. Um, the range of MSDs, uh, there's a broad range within that. Some of them might be just a, a, a one-off thing where there was a, um, uh, a, 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 a bit of uh, time off the line or a move around, but some of them will then have, have led into PIAB cases or different different sorts of things. So the range of those is very, very considerable. What we saw, uh, the result was for 2020, that we had one MSD recorded in the room. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, that's followed into 2021, where I think we've had one, maybe two reported in the room uh, this year so far. So really, really good positive results uh, on, on that side of things. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, and then, like, it's not often that projects of a uh, safety rating will manifest themselves in a financial benefit for the company. So one of the one of the things I would, like, it wasn't intended as a financial benefit it was or, or strictly financial. It was really intended around uh, reducing the uh, the MSD rates in the company and with the intent of reducing the attrition rates. But what actually happened um, was you'll see there from week 10 where we really kicked in, we saw a massive increase in our process yields. So as David would said, the, the, the work activity the guys were involved in was uh, boning out pork legs. Um, and the yield that you get from that is very, very considerable. The cost of meat is one of the highest costs that we have uh, on, on the site. So what, what, what we saw over the course of the year was an improvement in our process yields in that area by uh, 128,000 euros. So that's, that's measurable through our day-to-day our -day yield reports and, and, and verifiable. Um, through the uh, reduction in the attrition levels, um, we put a cost um, associated with uh, recruitment and attrition of €5,000 per head. That comes from time when we take people in, the interviewing process, the induction process, the training process, and the different types of things that happen uh, within that. So from, a, uh, from the attrition piece, the turnover piece, uh, we have a, a cost or value associated with that with €150,000. And then what we also saw was an improvement in our finished product yield, whereby because the guys were they, were, they were in their job longer, they were getting better at it, they were doing their job better, that the end product that we were receiving out of the area was actually better as well. So we saw uh, a €70,000 improvement in that as well. So in its entirety, the, the, the project uh, wrapped up over the course of the year with uh, which is a validated uh, figure of 350,000 euros. Um, and that's notwithstanding any any impending um, cases we may have 
you know, from MSD incidents that may have occurred that, that we've, we've offset. So overall, uh, the results that we saw throughout the whole process were, were, were astoundingly uh, positive. I want to go on to the next slide. Um, and back to you, David. Okay, so recapping. Um, work started in Q4 of 2019. What provoked this work was the, mus the rate of musculoskeletal disorders in one particular department and the level of attrition within that department. Through the use of COPSEC and TLX, um, we knew that a particip we knew that uh, there were significant psychosocial factors at play. And uh, these difficulties were born from uh, the stress and these difficulties mechanism. For that reason, a participatory job design approach um, job design intervention was delivered and through that participatory approach we changed the perceived level of control that these workers had in turn uh, left to that left uh, empowered that team came back with a model for work which meant that the headcount was reduced lines were slowed down job variety increased Productivity also increased as rework disappeared. And in turn, MSDs and staff attrition were essentially arrested. What makes the results a little bit um, better is that we essentially collected the baseline data just after Christmas, just, just before and just after Christmas in 2020. Um, we went back and measured those workers in April 2020, when societal anxiety related to COVID was at its highest. We found in April of 2020 that these workers were and tall, proud, happy to be in work when all that stuff was happening outside in, uh, in society. Um, so, so in essence, I think um, um, that's it then. Uh, so much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, David and Teddy and Chiara. Before I introduce our final speaker, I'd like to remind you that we will have a questions and answers session at the end. So if you have any questions to put them into the Q&A function, not to put them into the chat function because our, our speakers uh, will not see them in there. And if you don't see your Q&A function to remind you that there are three dots on the right hand side of your chat function. And if you click on that, then it'll appear. So just to have your questions uh, ready and to put them into the, the Q&A function. So I'll now introduce our final speaker this morning, Joanne Harmon of the Health and Safety Authority. Joanne is head of the Business and Education Support Unit within the Authority, and this unit develops guidance and supports for employers and employees, such as bsmart.ie, hsalearning.ie, and health, health and safety resources for use in the education system. Joanne holds an MBS in business practice, a diploma in corporate governance, as well as postgraduate qualifications in law and communications. She is also chairperson of Quality and Qualifications Ireland. The title of Joanne's presentation this morning is Planning for Working from Home. Thank you very much, Helen, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, some really interesting presentations so far, and I think we can all uh, learn from each other as we go through. Um, there's so many different angles to, to all of the subject matters that we're talking about this morning. Um, I'm going to be taking a slightly more broader look, I suppose, at what's happening in another area of growing importance um, in terms of er ergonomics, certainly, um, but in the broader um, and wider working world, I suppose, and that is uh, the move to working from home. I know many of us have been doing it uh, for a long time throughout the course of this pandemic, um, but we're now really, I suppose, starting to look forward and see how that might look um, into the future. It's one of the biggest shifts, as we know, um, over the last uh, 18 months or so uh, in terms of how people work and where people work and what the workplace uh, itself is, is looking like. So I suppose to put it in a little bit of context, um, and certainly in terms of the authorities' work, 
the future of work, I guess, as a topic is something that the authority considers on an ongoing basis. And certainly prior to the pandemic, we had um, a fairly large uh, future of work event. In fact, where we brought together a lot of the stakeholders and we started to look at um, things like the future of work and what it might look like and the kind of developments in the economy um, in terms of the way services were provided, in terms of new technologies that were coming on stream. And we were looking at those and considering what might uh, future jobs look like? Um, what would the new ways of working look like? Um, what contractual arrangements might be there? Are we looking at more self-employed people, more people in the gig economy? And what that employer-employee relationship might, uh, might begin to look like? So we had a, a very significant event and started to look at, at some of those areas and we started to, to plan uh, some of our own work around that. The government was also looking at the whole area of remote working and it conducted um, a range of its own sort of research. And of course, it has been ongoing uh, in the in the run up, I suppose, to, to this time. And in April 2021, the government launched its national remote working strategy called Making Remote Work. Um, and I guess it has a fairly uh, ambitious target. I think I say 25% there. I think it's around the 25% or so of the public service working remotely. So that'd be one of its key objectives to sort of normalize a sense of remote working uh, more than likely on a kind of hybrid basis. The other thing um, the government did was um, uh, as part of this plan, the WRC um, adopted and, and developed a, a right to disconnect uh, code of practice. Um, and this is obviously um, really uh, enshrining that right. It's a very important right for uh, employees to be able to switch off um, outside of work. Um, and this is going to be very important in any remote uh, working context. Uh, the right to requ request remote working, um, as we know, is also going to be enshrined in legislation <clears throat> and that is uh, uh, to be considered in this uh, uh, dual term. And that's something that will be very important also for employees. Um, and it does, as I said, enshrine the right to request remote working and employers will have to, um, to, to justify and have good reason to refuse um, an employee's uh, request. So I suppose these are the kind of broader um, context uh, around remote working and the consideration around that. When um, the COVID pandemic hit, and I suppose many of us found ourselves working overnight, um, the department had set up an interdepartmental group to look at the whole area. And I think it's important to say that um, health and safety considerations are really just one part of that uh, for employers. And the department, uh, our own department produced um, a set of guidance for working remotely, um, which is at the, the link there on the department's website. Um, and it covers a whole range of areas such as employment conditions, um, the Working Time Act, data protection, um, equality, um, training, all of those kind of areas. So health and safety is really just uh, one of those uh, considerations. And as we know, there's a lot of discussion around the benefits um, of remote working in terms of uh, lower commuting times, um, environmental benefits, um, sort of a more balanced regional development, um, maybe making our cities less crowded. Um, as well as benefits for employers around maybe opening up the pool of uh, talent that's open to them if they can give people a greater choice around where they might work. On the other side, of course, we're seeing, I suppose, uh, the kind of risks that need to be considered uh, by the employer and having a strong awareness around those, uh, not just ergonomic risks, but certainly ergonomic risks are amongst them, um, but a whole range of areas. And um, I see that the psychosocial was mentioned there uh, very much by David and Terry in their presentation. And it's something similar, you know, for working from home. Um, there are a whole other uh, range of risks around possibly isolation, the lack of social contact, um, mental health issues and remote working stress that can arise for people as well. So I'm just going to move on there. So just, I suppose, in terms of without 
making it a, a COVID-19 uh, presentation, but I think it's important, I suppose, that in many ways, a lot of our consideration around remote working has been accelerated uh, by COVID-19. And as I said, the fact that we many of us found ourselves working from home. And just really to draw your awareness to um, the section of the HSA website, um, on COVID-19, as you know, um, the authority is responsible for enforcing uh, the work safely protocol, but also providing a whole range of business um, supports, both to employers and employees there. And if you go into the website, you can see there's a, a number of areas there uh, on guidance and advice for employers. Um, business supports, which include checklists and templates for employers and employees. Uh, we have translated a uh, number of COVID-19 resources and some of our employee checklists, uh, indeed, which we uh, promoted through uh, a project we did with uh, the meat industry actually in the southeast of the country. Uh, public health advice is there and a link through INAB, which uh, deals with laboratory assessment and, and COVID-19. So just important uh, to note that the there is advice there around COVID-19 and within that uh, we have a range of advice around uh, remote working. So when you go into our and you can search for it by topic also on the, on the HSA website, I think it's important again to note that uh, we developed some FAQs for employers and employees early enough on in the pandemic. Uh, to help people manage that, you know, that temporary arrangement where they're finding themselves working from home and really helping people to set up as best as they can. Um, and there are a whole uh, range of issues there in terms of, you know, setting up as well as you can ergonomically uh, and the remote working stress that I, I touched on and just, you know, what employers, what the kind of considerations employers should have, um, have setting up really good communications, um, particularly where employees are uh, working from home 100% of the time. And as we move forward, we think, you know, that's more likely to change where employers and employees want to set up those arrangements in a kind of a planned way. But it would be much more likely to be on a, um, a hybrid uh, situation where people are working in and out of the office or their workplace and then working from home alternatively. So the other thing we did, which we had been planning for, but again, I suppose came into the fore very much uh, once COVID hit, was uh, guidance on working from home. So the authority developed this guidance, it's for employers and employees, and really it's specifically uh, in terms of planning for remote working arrangements in an agreed way. Um, and that's an important thing to say, because I think the pandemic, as we know, threw up all sorts of uh, circumstances for people that were not ideal. But this is very much around, you know, we see people are you know, maybe looking to work from home. It's something we think we'd like to do for our business, for our employees. So how do we go about doing that um, in a safe and sustained way that's going to work for uh, me as an employer or for my uh, employees who are looking uh, and seeking to um, maybe continue with this arrangement or to enter a kind of a hybrid arrangement. So just before I, I touch on that, I think it's uh, it's just useful to reflect that, you know, working from home, as we know, uh, that employers um, must, uh, you know, follow the, the legislation and apply the regulations um, uh, in terms of health and safety legislation, whether uh, employees are at the workplace or working from home. And that's very important to say. And there's a range of legislation um, that uh, Ita and uh, Frank have been touched on as well around general the general apps regulations. Uh, in terms of the workplace equipment that's to be provided and a whole range of topics that are covered within those applications. Um, the other thing I suppose in terms of, of our economics is important uh, just to note is the DSE uh, review which is taking place at EU level looking at display uh, screen uh, equipment uh, directive and the Commission have also uh, decided to have uh, a wider look at um, the whole working from home area now that the pandemic has hit and uh, we know that it is uh, going to be uh, a way of working into the future for the, the citizens of Europe. So no harm just to be aware of that, you know, a range of legislation and regulations are obviously governing uh, working from home. 
So I think one of the most important things for employers who are planning on this and for employees who are seeking to work from home is really to be aware of the duties of employers and the duties of employees when considering a home working or remote working. So under the uh, Safety and Health uh, Act, 2005 Act, um, as I said, employers have the same duties towards employees working from home remotely as they do towards employees located in the workplace. And I think it's important to note that employers are making employees aware of any specific risks regarding working from home and ensuring that the work and the workspace are suitable for the work to be done. And that's absolutely critical because if the workspace is not suitable for the work uh, that the employer wants uh, to be done in the home and the employee is agreeing to take on, then um, home working may not be an option for some employees. The employer must provide suitable and safe equipment to enable the work to be done, also critical. And then obviously, you know, making sure that there are uh, good systems of communication and contact with the employee. And of course, carrying out the risk assessment of the employee's workstation, that DSE assessment, which of course, as we know, uh, must be done, uh, the employee is entitled to it. Um, and provide any training uh, required for employees as part of remote working, uh, whether there are new systems in place, new equipment, um, and very much making the employee aware of uh, any risks inherent. So the employee duties, again, very important, I think that um, employees, that they identify a suitable space for work, for home working, and that they're aware that they have to do that. That's really important. It's an employee responsibility. There must be suitable light, heat and ventilation to be able to work comfortably in the home. And they must keep their workspace uh, tidy, obviously keeping the work area free from noise, interruptions and distractions, making sure the floor space is uh, well kept, uh, clean, dry, free from slips and uh, trip hazards and providing suitable power sockets, you know, avoiding trailing cables, etc., overloading of sockets. Um, and ensuring that they have uh, adequate broadband and phone, for example, as part of the infrastructure in their home that they are um, then making available, if you like, uh, for the workspace. So in terms of the guidance itself on working from home for employers and employees, again, it's a very, very useful and practical guide, both for employers in planning uh, this uh, to offer this for their employees and also for employees to be very much aware of, of how it works and what they would need to be um, aware of. There are 12 sections in it. And again, it very simply outlines the kind of employer employee responsibilities, uh, home working policy, which I'll speak about in a moment and is absolutely critical for employers to put in place. What are the home office and workstation requirements? What's required in terms of workstation setup, display screen, um, equipment and assessment? And again, the kind of uh, ancillary issues like training, what, what should be done there? What needs to be put in place? An awareness around the psychosocial and work related stress, what might need to be put in place for sensitive risk groups, um, such as pregnant employees um, uh, uh, or employees with a disability, for example. The risk assessment element, and again, just drawing the employer's awareness to the fact that uh, risk uh, assessment does have to be carried out um, uh, where employees are working from home. And of course, um, reminding people that this certainly is done um, at the moment uh, remotely and using technology and can be done going forward. Uh, the authority uh, is not certainly advocating for um, employers to be going into people's homes to carry out these risk assessments. They can be done very straightforwardly, as we know, using technology remotely. Communication is also addressed um, and the home office environment. And again, drawing employees' uh, attention to the kind of good and safe setup um, that they would be responsible for. So the, there's a range of sections in the guidance, as I mentioned, um, and then appended to that is a home working uh, risk assessment and checklist, which uh, is very um, useful in terms of the practical steps uh, to be put in place for uh, both employer and employee. 
So just drawing your attention to the home working policy, I, I would argue that it's probably the most critical element that the employer needs to take account of in setting up um, a home working framework, if you like. It's really what's going to remove the, I suppose, the surprises for the employee, um, avoid misunderstandings for the employee and really not start people on a process that perhaps can't be seen through. So I think it's very, very important. It needs to set out the employer and employee obligations. So who's responsible for what, who's doing what needs to be set out very clearly in the policy. What are the criteria and requirements for when employees work from home? What are the, the, the arrangements there? What must be in place um, if there's an agreement uh, to be reached with the employee around working from home? What information is spelt out on arrangements for risk assessment of the home working space? Does the employee know that this will be risk assessed and how it will be risk assessed? Um, and that it's a, you know, it's a good thing for the employee to have this because it's going to help them to set up properly and it's going to make sure that the employer is discharging their duty in, in um, having good, safe uh, equipment and safe systems for work uh, for employees. It should also outline any responsibilities employees have, whether it's reporting um, any damage to equipment or equipment that needs to be replaced or an accident that happens in the course of their work at home, um, spelling out really all of the obligations for uh, employees. And also, I think critically, it needs to provide information on the suitability of the workspace for the work to be carried out. So again, that goes back to the idea of there being uh, no surprises, as it were. Um, you know, what is the type of work that can be carried out at home? What is the expectation around that? And what the expectation is around that dedicated workspace that can be set up, that's safe, suitable and free from distraction. Um, the policy should also lay out what equipment will be required by the employer uh, to the employee. Um, for example, you can see there the desk, the chair, the monitor, the keyboard, the kind of I suppose, standard items we might find in an office. There may be other items depending on the work. And again, it's critical that this relates to the work to be carried out. The employer must provide that equipment. And again, I touched on earlier that what means of communication and training will be provided. So I think it's certainly worthwhile the employer spending the time to develop a really good home working policy. Um, and again, there are whole, lots of areas in there outside of health and safety that need to be considered. But I think it, it's the it's the one policy, I think, that will help um, uh, expectations to be managed and allow people to be very clear about what, where the responsibilities lie. So in terms of the guidance itself, within the, the guidance, it's a you know, short enough uh, document. There are five um, key steps to developing um, uh, to, to managing home working, really. And I guess um, very briefly, um, one is, as I mentioned there, is developing the home working policy critical. Um, step two is uh, identifying consulting with employees who will work from home, who would like to work from home, and, and engaging them around that. And I guess uh, a little bit like uh, Dave and Terry's presentation, that level of consultation, engagement, um, giving ownership to people possibly around working through joint solutions because it's going to be different for every single employer and uh, you want to work for everybody if it's going to be sustainable going forward. So having that level of identification, consultation and um, making the policy known, clear and available to your employees and then looking at what equipment and resources are required. That's very important so that uh, people are very clear about what's expected in terms of their home infrastructure and what will be supplied by the employer. In terms of step four, the uh, appendix, the appendix risk assessment stroke checklist is very useful here because that can be used to um, uh, obviously conduct the risk assessment in the first place, the checklist of, of um, equipment to be provided, but then actually conducting the risk assessment with the employee and going through, um, which is a learning experience in itself and a, a training experience in itself in many ways around assessing the homework environment um, and identifying any areas that need to be improved or addressed and then being able to come back and make sure that they are done. Um, 
and obviously step five, it's really part of a, a loop in many ways. It's that monitoring, reviewing and communicating with employees as they move through the whole working experience, making sure that um, issues are addressed and that good practices are set up really from the outset. So in terms of just looking at the, um, the appendix uh, risk assessment checklist, if you like, the, the two step process is, is clear within that. Step one is identifying your equipment and resources required by the employee. And this is something that you can you know, identify together, have that discussion. Um, and when the equipment is identified, then you're making sure the employer, the employee um, has that equipment or you provide that equipment uh, to them uh, if they need it to carry out their job. The second step then is the risk assessment itself. So the equipment has been supplied, uh, as we know, the employee is working from home and that risk assessment is carried out. And um, I know just most of you will know this, but obviously it needs to be carried out by a competent person um, and whether that's provided internally in the organization or um, with an external competence, that's obviously uh, fine too. So I'm not going to go through uh, all of these slides in great detail. This is just gives you an idea of what the uh, risk assessment checklist looks like. And obviously it's got the, uh, an image on the left and then it's, it's asking a series of questions um, which the assessor will go through with the employee as to whether um, X or Y has been addressed or is in place. And then it allows for comment and follow up action. So there's about, I think, 10 or 11 uh, different uh, areas addressed within the, uh, the home working risk assessment, that DSE assessment, and it includes the workstation itself, uh, the setup of the chair that's provided, um, screen um, uh, in terms of positioning, etc., all of the, the normal kind of questions that are asked as part of this assessment communication, not just in terms of the equipment, but in terms of arrangements in place uh, around consultation, uh, reporting, uh, health related issues, accidents, equipment, etc. Um, keyboard mouse um, is there, uh, lighting is there, um, help is there, obviously, and then including information around eye and eye tests so that employees are aware uh, of what they're entitled to if they're using their VDU on an ongoing basis. Heating and ventilation, again, something that is the responsibility of the uh, employee uh, themselves in their own uh, homes. Um, electricity, again, is, is uh, addressed there in terms of the assessment and the various questions asked, which again can be useful for employees who may not always be aware, even in their own homes, around what, um, what uh, they should be addressing just in terms of um, the normal management of your home. And fire is also listed there around uh, checking any equipment or monitors, whatever they would have in their home, uh, as that is the responsibility of the, uh, the employee. So there's an allowance there again, in terms of the form, uh, additional information findings, signed off uh, obviously by both, and then the follow up to that. So uh, just finishing there in that last slide is really just a links to further resources. Again, you can Google any of these or, or, or look them up directly uh, within the, the, the web or the HSA website itself. And then just to draw your attention to two of our key tools at the end, um, uh, bsmart.ie, which is a free risk assessment and safety statements uh, tool of the authority provides that um, and businesses, employers can go in and, and, and conduct uh, the risk assessment and get a free safety statement at the end. And also hsalearning.ie, which has a range of e-learning courses there also free to access. So again, I suppose, Helen, it's a whistle stop tour around the, the guidance and um, just to say uh, thanks for your attention and uh, over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Well, Joanne was the last of our speakers this morning, so we've now got time for questions and answers. And I'd remind you to just, if you have a question, that there's been a lot of useful talks and there's been a lot of useful detail in it, though, that you might have some questions or queries. So jot them into the Q&A box. Um, if you just jot your question in there, we'll come to it. Um, I'd invite all the speakers to put their cameras on and I'll hand you over to my colleague, Barry Devitt, who will moderate the Q&A session.
Thanks, Alan. We don't have a huge amount of questions here this morning, but I have one for Frank. And Frank, that's in relation to the Mac tool. Are there any plans for an online version of the Mac tool? Yes. Thanks, Barry. Uh, yeah, that's an important point, actually. Uh, the Health and Safety Executive has been working on the development of an online version of the of the Mac tool and the other tools. And uh, the latest information I have is that they have uh, an online version which uh, is going to be available very soon. And um, information on that would be available on the HZ UK website uh, because I think that will be a great addition particularly for people you know on the move uh, so uh, and again there's other there are other tools I mean I know Ethan mentioned easier ago as well so there's a, a definitely a, a lot more online versions of these tools being made available which is a good thing so thanks for that question thanks Frank that's all the questions I have at the moment um I'll, I'll hand you back to Helen there I do apologize, Helen. I've just got a question. Literally came in as soon as, you, as soon as I start talking. And the question's for jo Joanne. In relation to the chair to be supplied to the employees for working at home, what is the minimum we can provide? Well, actually, I'm thinking Frank might be in a better position to answer that question. It's probably more economic related, but I'm just looking, Barry. I can see there's a whole series of questions in the Q&A section. Uh, on the right, are you going to be going through those, Barry? Or yeah, hi, Joanne. I'm just looking at this here at the moment. I've got about three questions in here at the moment. Are you seeing more of them? I am. Yes, I'm seeing about okay. ten questions. I'm oh, seeing. Okay. Just, just give me one second. <laughs> anyway, back I, into it, yeah. maybe hand you back uh, to Frank yeah. for that question around the chair specification. Frank, you'll be more yeah, tuned yes, to that than uh, I. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne, for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no problem. Um, yeah, there are minimum requirements uh, in terms of the type of seating, and it's it's enshrined in the regulation, uh, the the general application regulations in Schedule Four, uh, which is associated with the display screen equipment regulation. It talks about the chair uh, seating should be adjustable. The overall seat should be adjustable in height, and as well as that, the backrest, more importantly as well, has to be adjustable in height. Uh, uh, and and there are important points uh, to to consider. I mean, there are minimum requirements. If 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 employers want to look at other options, they, they can they can look at that. Uh, but in terms of the the regulation, there are the minimum requirements. So thank you for that question. Perhaps if I could just clarify, uh, not clarify, to go beyond what Frank is saying. There is that once the basic requirements are um, covered, the chair does not have to be expensive. The most the most important thing from a very practical perspective is that the chair has those adjustments that Frank mentioned. The cost of a chair really should reflect how long the chair is going to last more than the super duper all encompassing everything adjustable. That's not needed. The basic adjustments are often better rather than having the, the, the Rolls Royce of chairs. Thanks very much, Eva. Joanne, you said you can see 10 questions in the Q&A. I can, oh, I can see them coming in now. They're just updated here in that. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, there's one for Joanne here again, and it's in relation to equipment provided to employees. Um, what, ex what, what is the expectation to review preventative uh, maintenance when, they are in, when the employees are at home? OK, well, I suppose the important thing to say is that the employer is responsible for the equipment that they provide to the employee in the home. But obviously, the employer needs to know uh, when there is a, a problem or likely to be a problem uh, with any of the equipment they provide. So I think that's an important part of the communication agreement between employer and employee, that the employee is taking a common sense, practical approach to, you know, looking after the equipment in the normal way they would. And if something, whether it's, um, you know, a, a light on a machine indicating that uh, service is required or or another a piece or part of equipment um, that that is notified to the employer and that the employer is clear that they are um, to provide and to maintain an update um, uh, and, and, up, and pr provide for the upkeep of the equipment indeed that they provide to the employee. Um, it, it, ancillary equipment provided by the employee themselves um, is, is their own business and it's something that they uh, are responsible for. But anything provided by the uh, employer, they must uh, 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 upkeep and maintain, but the employee must notify them of any issues they're having. 
Thanks, Jim. I have another question here, and it says, would space in an employee's home have an impact? Yes, the answer to that would be yes. And I suppose as part of the uh, identifying the suitability uh, for the space in which the work is to be carried out, that's important for the employee. And obviously in terms of the, the risk assessment and the DSE assessment of the workstation, you know, the assessor will be engaging with the employee around the space they have, um, you know, under the table, around them, whether there are, aren't trailing cables across the room, etc. So, yes, the answer is it is important. The space uh, where the workstation is uh, located is important and should be included as part of um, assessing for suitability and as part of the, the uh, risk assessment of the workstation. Thanks very much, Joanne. That's the last question I have here anyway from, so, from the, the attendees. Perhaps I could just, again, from a very practical perspective, uh, being involved with doing home workstation assessments here in LCE, what we, uh, during the COVID scenario, when lockdown was uh, a government requirement, we weren't as focused on the space requirements. So if somebody had to work from home and all they could do was sit on a bed with a laptop, we'd obviously give them as best advice possible, but they possibly had no choice. In relation to that arrangement from, with the employee and those and the employer, now during assessments, we actually have to take account of if someone is sitting on their, in a bed with a laptop, that's not a suitable location to continue working uh, from home. So um, how we would assess that is we'd use either the camera on the laptop, for example, or we might log in with someone on, on Teams on their phone and ask them to show us their workstation so that we can see that clearance beneath their workstation, the training cables, and all of that is critical um, when you're doing your, that remote VDU assessment. You have to have sight of the workplace. Um, a questionnaire doesn't give you the right information to ensure that the work, workplace is suitable. Yeah. Exactly, Eva, and I think that's the, the difference, isn't it, between yeah. the kind of the pandemic arrangement and the planned arrangements going yeah. forward. That is, we're all in a much better position to be able to plan for that. Uh, Barry, I have some additional questions here. Will I read them out? Because I think actually maybe they were sent to me directly. I'm not sure, but I think everybody they may have, answers. Joanne, if you could basically just yeah. answer those, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I just ca call that out. Um, a question regarding risk assessment for planned remote working arrangements. What practical steps um, are required from loan from the loan worker pr perspective? And should such uh, be a specific question or questions on the template risk assessment? Is this a focus for all assessments or just those for employees within sensitive risk groups? Well, absolutely. I think the, the loan worker is another consideration um, in terms of the risk assessment. I think for many employees and employers are starting to look at, um, if you like, the remote clock in and clock out, and that will become, if you like, a technical feature for a lot of employees and employers will be able to, I suppose, gauge you know, where people are at, are they in, are they out? Um, yes, it, it, it needs to be considered also in terms of, of communications. Um, supervision may need to change, management practices may need to change, but certainly um, the lone worker, even though it might, it might look different, if you like, because it's somebody at home, but it should be taken into account. And I think that employers and employees can, or employees can address that depending on the setup in their own um, workplaces. Uh, would anybody else like to... Uh, comment on that one. Any specific insights around loan workers? No, I think we're okay no, on that. Yeah, one. I think you're okay on that. It's just on, uh, uh, Barry, just there, and there's another question there which I think I'll take. It was from Pat, uh, Pat Garden. It's around uh, are DSE self assessments made by an employee, employee using a reputable software tool that includes a training module acceptable for risk assessment purposes? Uh, this is a very important question, actually, and I need to kind of just make make it clear from our perspective that uh, as any kind of self-assessment software tool for, you know, assessing for the individual to just assess their own workstation is not a risk assessment. Uh, it's a delegation of responsibility. The uh, point that uh, Joanne made is a very important point is that as far as the Health and Safety Authority is concerned, the assessment, uh, the risk assessment of the workstation needs to be conducted independently of the employee by a competent assessor. So who is in a position to observe and review uh, 
and in a virtual sense, uh, the workstation in the home environment. So that's a very important point to make that a self-assessment software package is not a risk assessment. So thanks for that question, Pat. Okay. Um, I have another few here, which I'll just continue to whip through. Um, what type of equipment does the HSA recommend that the employer provide? Is this up to the employer to define? Is there any guidance on this? Well, I think as I probably alluded to in my presentation and certainly the guidance on working from home will be clear on, um, the employer must provide the equipment uh, for the work to be carried out. And that is not to say that if I'm an employee and I've been sitting at a desk for the last year and a half, that as part of the risk assessment will show that that desk is fine to continue using. Not every employee wants to take on a load of additional equipment in their home when they already have perfectly good equipment, you know, a, a good chair, etc. As Ita said, it doesn't, it's it's not all about the shiniest, the brightest, and the most expensive. If you have the equipment, you're happy to use it, that's absolutely fine. Um, so if you think about matching the job uh, and the equipment and the work to be done, I think would be a fairly sensible way of approaching that. Um, another question is, can you clarify that it is the employee who identifies that the area they choose is suitable to work from home and that they must assess the risks, not the employer? with the exception of the VDU assessment. And then there's a, just a comment, employer has no right to enter the home place to, uh, to assess. Well, I think uh, Frank partly answered that question already. The employee's role is to identify the area that they think is suitable within the home, but they are not conducting the risk assessment of that area. And I think Frank has made that very clear. And we talked about the workspace, so not just the workstation, but the workspace around that. And we talked about, I think, making that very clear in planning, planned arrangements going forward. I think, Ita, you said you're, you're looking at that workspace now, whereas before, obviously, people were at kitchen tables and on beds and all sorts of things. So hopefully that's clear. It's not the um, employee who conducts that risk assessment. And the employer having no right to enter the home place to um, assess, I think most people would agree going forward. And even now, these uh, risk assessments are done remotely and can be done remotely very successfully. And certainly the authority isn't advocating uh, for employers to be you know, reaching agreements with employees around entering their homes um, because the home is obviously the, the primary dwelling. Um, there's another one here. Uh, is it acceptable for an employee to run through a checklist themselves? And if any concerns, a competent person follows up and completes the assessment with them. Um, I think, Frank, you've already answered that question, essentially, that the risk assessment is done by somebody independently of the employee and that they must be a competent person. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there is a. There is no harm. I mean, if the employee is a key part of the risk assessment process and the consultation process, and certainly they should use the risk assessment process uh, as an opportunity to to raise any issues if they have not already been flagged. Um, so that it's important to keep that in mind. Thanks. Yeah, they were all the questions that came up on mine. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Joanne. That's great. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Frank. I'm going to hand back to Helen now. Thanks very much. OK, thanks, Barry, and thanks to you all. And thanks for all the questions. We've come to the end of this morning's webinar, but I'd like to. Give a very big thank you, first of all, to all our speakers and to my colleagues behind the scenes who have made this webinar possible this morning. The speakers, I feel, have provided you with insight, guidance, advice, and I hope that the innovation, the team working and the problem solving skills that you've seen in the case studies, that they will inspire you and help you to manage the risk of musculoskeletal disorders in your workplace. And just a final reminder, when you log off of the webinar, you will get an online survey and it's very short and we'd ask that you would uh, fill it in because it will assist us. And finally, thank you to all of you for taking the time to attend our webinar this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you.